So new school year, new concerns and questions from parents from our annual back to school survey. And you've been so great to sit down with us for multiple years now. So let's hop right into it. Let's go. 65% of the back to school survey participants shared they have financial concerns headed into the new school year. Where and how can the school district help or how are you receiving that information? I mean, uh, just like the school district, you know, we're in a budget crunch with everything that's going on with inflation and so are the families and we're aware of that. So as a school district, we have an outreach department that that is what they focus on. They, they work on attendance, but it's really outreach because there's lots of barriers that are financially related. Maybe they don't have school supplies. Maybe they can't get their immunizations. Maybe they can't get clothes. And that's what that department does in conjunction with our counseling department, our health service department. We are constantly reaching out, making sure that, hey, whatever barriers you have, we want to support that because we need you to be at school to teach you and we don't want the finances to keep you from that. And we are fortunate in Paraland ISD that we have a great community. We have an organization that meets at Paraland ISD called United for Kids. It's every nonprofit in the Brazoria County area that comes together and they sit down and go, what can we do to help our families? If they had a fire or if they can't pay their rent or if their bill is behind or they got evicted or whatever it may be, we all sit there and we determine what needs do we have and who can take care of them. The community is always stepping up. I had a church reach out to me just recently and said, hey, after the hurricane, I understand people's groceries are a problem. Can we do a grocery drive? Okay, let's do a grocery drive. And so we figured out where we were gonna do it. We reached out to the community. They showed up, had bags and bags of groceries. All you had to do was drive by. We put the groceries in your car, have a great day. That, that's what happens in Pearland. And so I understand the issues that families have and we are constantly looking how we can remove any barriers related to financial need. You said that outreach department is usually focused on attendance. Is there a parallel there between attendance and financial hardships? Yeah, a, a direct parallel. Uh, a lot of times when students can't come to school that maybe they can't get to the doctor. Maybe they can't get their immunizations or they can't get the school clothes or the supplies and so maybe either embarrassment or time plays a part to where they don't come to school. So anytime we can remove that barrier, we can get them in school. Got it. With finances a big concern, we had one parent ask, when are teachers going to get pay raises? Well, uh, they've gotten them. Our board over the last two years have given a total of 6% uh, general pay increase. We also did something called equity adjustments where we looked at some equity payments that weren't the same or needed to increase in certain pay ranges, especially our paraprofessionals. Our special education paraprofessionals that service our life skills students and our BSI students and our inclusion students, we wanted to make sure that they were compensated appropriately because they do a lot of work in the classroom and we wanted to take care of them. And our board stepped up for that. Something else our board did this year is they look at the insurance rates. You know, we give over two years, a 6% general pay increase, but then insurance goes up 9%. Well, we just wiped out that pay increase. And so there's not a lot we can do about that, but our board stepped up and said, hey, can we contribute more to the employee compensation or the employee part of the insurance process to reduce that for our employees? And they did that as well. Now, while it's never enough, and I hope the state of Texas and the legislature steps up and says, hey, we're gonna help this out, but we definitely in Paraland ISD, like I said, over the past two years, 6%. Do you foresee that increasing or is that all dependent on the state? It's all dependent on budget. I mean, uh, human resources payroll is 86% of our budget. So when you talk about a 2% raise, you're talking about millions and millions of dollars. And we are very tight on our budget. Parallel ISD is fortunate that we have managed our finances very well. We've gotten support from our community. We passed a Vader and we also passed a bond that's helped us with our general operating budget. So we're not in a deficit budget right now. But if we don't get some relief, if that basic allotment doesn't get addressed or we get some allotments fixed for special education or emergent bilingual, we're going to be back in a deficit budget. So we definitely need the legislator to realize that all students need support and it starts with money. Let's switch it up and talk about the classroom. Let's go. Do you have enough teachers this school year and do you have a greater need in some areas of study or needs than others? I was worried about that because last year there was a little bit, you know, the talent pool, as you may say, for teachers. Who wants to be a teacher? Nobody's coming. This year we've kind of had a great talent pool and early we had more teachers coming in when our job fair was happening. All of our departments like, we have great teachers coming in. We have a plethora to choose from where before in some of our classes are maybe one. Well, now we have three, four or five to choose from. Doesn't mean all of the holes have been filled. Still special programs. When, when we have teachers that need to work in a life skills program, that is very difficult because you may be dealing with all types of medical issues, behavior issues, instructional issues. So that is where we're seeing our deficit right now. So anybody that wants to be a life skills teacher and make an impactful change for those students, please come to Paraland ISD. But for the most part, 
we are staffed. We are taken care of. Uh, where we do have some deficits or vacancies, we have long-term subs in place. It's interesting because in talking to the different school districts, most seem to have that shortage or that need in the special needs category and with your paraprofessionals that would be working with special yes, needs children. Uh, why do you think the pool of candidates is better this year? Because we were hearing from so many different school districts that there were challenges there with the hiring pool. Why do you think suddenly this year it's better? Well, one, we did give some pay raises, but I'd like to think it's the culture in Pearland ISD. When teachers are looking around and can be selective because they are in high demand and high need, they look at the districts they want to work at. And I, and I take it as a badge of honor of what our principal's doing and what our campuses are doing and the support of our community, that when they say, where do I want to work? I'd like to work in Pearland ISD. When we welcomed 160 new teachers, and I'm not talking zero year, they could be zero year to multiple years, I told them, thank you for choosing us because you didn't have to, you could have worked anywhere. And we're gonna make sure that that trust you're giving us by coming to work here, we're gonna repay it. We're gonna make sure that you feel supported and taken care of, and this is gonna be a great place to work. Similar to last year, when we visited, we had questions and concerns expressed in the survey responses about students' behavior mm -hmm. and discipline and behavioral problems in regard to being disruptive to other students in the classroom. A parent says in the survey, the current approach isn't working. Your response? My response is I don't disagree with them. And, and some of that is, is we get focused on the individual student behavior and want to deal with discipline. How is that student going to be punished? Well, that's the end game. The behavior has already happened. The students already, that's their mode of operation. We have to get in front of that. So as a district, we are working on a culture and an approach to where we set expectations. We have some non-negotiables going around where we talk about success is not an accident set the tone, make sure that all the expectations are known. Relationships matter. You have to make relationships with those students to know what they are, who they are, and what they need to help curtail those behaviors. We have to have a fresh start. I may be in the classroom on Monday and had a bad day. You don't know why I had a bad day. Well, don't hold that against me on Tuesday because you're setting me up for failure. And then the last thing is, is to make sure that you are present and aware of what is going on in the classroom at all times and have consistency. So we're working with our teachers and our administrators to work on positive culture. And that way when the students come in, that's what greets them. When they're greeted at the door with a hello or a high five and they come in and they're allowed to make mistakes, it can curtail some of those frustrations. But behavior is still going to happen and we have to address it. So we are putting in place consistency across the board. We have talked in the cabinet level or the upper administration level. We have to have tightly held beliefs and loosely held beliefs. And behavior kind of got loose because we had grace after COVID and it just carried on. You want to talk about long COVID? Talk about the behavior school had after COVID. We just didn't want to let it go. Well, we got to get back to some accountability. We got to get back to holding students accountable for their behavior, teachers accountable for their classroom management, and parents accountable. And once we're all on the same page, we can address those behaviors more effectively. Yeah, it sounds like it's a little bit more preventative as well. There's the accountability side of it, but the preventative side We got to get in front of it. Of it. You, we can't always be reactive. We, we have to get in front and, and teach those expectations. We, we talked about this in our training just today. If a student is in the classroom and struggling to read, you don't kick them out. You teach them how to read. If a student's in the classroom struggling how to behave, we kick them out. Let's teach them how to behave. We're educators. So this is interesting. Books continue to be a subject of interest. We hope so. And uh, one survey participant wants to know what steps are schools, Pearland schools, taking to ensure students have access to all books. Access to all books. Well, we haven't closed libraries. Libraries still apparent. I think what you're leaning on is when people want to, to ban books for maybe their content. Yes. Well, us, like every school district, has a process for that. So if, if a parent or a community member or even a student is like, hey, I think this book is inappropriate, they can have an informal complaint or a formal complaint and we'll go through a review process. Mm -hmm. Paraland ISD have had zero of those. We've had no formal complaints on books. Our librarians do a very good job of curating the need for all students, but they also look at the appropriateness of it. Because you can have a book that talks about any subject matter in an appropriate way, or you can have a book that talks about it in an inappropriate way. So it's not necessarily the subject matter, but it's the content we want to make sure is not too inappropriate. And so I give kudos to our librarians and our supervisors over the librarians over how they get the collections into the library. And then we have processes in place because some of the material is a little bit more adult. When you're in a high school and you have a ninth grader and you have a twelfth grader, there's a lot of maturity in between there. And so some of the books are in different locations or in different places, and parents can go onto our system and they can tag and say, I don't want my kid to have this book, no problem. So we give the parent the power. You can tell us right away, that book can stay in your library, but don't let my kid have it. 
When you say you've had zero complaints for books. Zero formal complaints to remove a book. And are you saying for the past couple of school years Ever. or since these mandates have been put in place by since, the state? Since, since it's become a topic mm -hmm. in, in the political atmosphere and all that is happening, we have had no formal. Uh, our board, I may get the years wrong, three years ago did a review of the process when the law had changed. And since that review of the process and policy, no formal complaints have come in. Let's talk safety. Mm -hmm. That's always top of mind with every year with the survey. Parents want to know in Pearland, how are you going to ensure the safety of students and staff on each and every campus? We're going to build on the success that we have. From 2016, Pearland was kind of ahead of the game. When we passed a bond, we did a lot of hardening of our schools. We did the safety glass and the vestibules and the numbering and the radio controls. And so we're a little bit ahead of the game. If you know, TEA does audits. They, they're coming through and they're doing intruder audits and building door audits and a walk around the campus. 23 campuses, 100% compliance, zero findings. We want to build on that. We just hired a new executive director of uh, Safe and Secure Schools, Mr. Palumbo. He's come on board. He's working on standard safety protocols. He's reviewing everything that we're doing to make sure we're effective. Uh, in September, we're going to have a district vulnerability assessment. We want TEA to come in as part of TEA's process and look at everything that we do and where are we vulnerable. We think we're good, but we could be missing some stuff. We always Did, want to be better. Is the district inviting them to come, or is that part it, of it's their a mandatory, annual assessment? It's a mandatory. It's new this mm -hmm. year, and so uh, we are going to meet with the team, and then we're going to go over what the district vulnerability assessment is, and they're going to come in September and be with us for about three days, visit our campuses, visit our classrooms, talk to teachers, administrators, parents, and students, and then give us an assessment of this is where we see your strengths, and this is where we see your issues, and how we can fix these. And that's the only way we can continue to get better. We can't rest. Safety is everybody's job. It's our students' jobs, it's our teachers' jobs, it's our parents' jobs. Second week of school, we do a, a drill week because mm -hmm. you have all these drills. You have a fire drill and a lockdown drill and a hole drill and all of these standard protocols. So the first week of, or the second week of school, every campus does drill week. We let the parents know so there's no fear. We teach the kids what this drill is. And when we continue to practice them through the year, they have that mental muscle that when the drill happens and it's a crisis, we know what we're doing. We know what we're expected. I know safety is on everyone to conduct and make sure that all is well, but what about the Pearland ISD police force? Do you have enough officers? And what does it look like per campus? Well, uh, yes and no. We have enough officers, but in our SRO program, it was the law was passed where we have to have an armed officer to every campus. Well, the funding didn't come that with that. We, we got about $500,000 in additional funding, but it's about a $3.5 million bill to get officers on every campus. We have a great working relationship with the Pearland PD. So all of our junior highs through high school have an officer stationed on the campus. Then we've worked out a rotation to where the off-duty officers sign up and they rotate through the campuses. So they're not necessarily part of our SRO program, but the patrol officers go to our schools to make sure that the safety and protocols are all taking place and we have an armed officer on campus. So yes, we do have enough Pearland Police Department, but I would love to bring all of those officers onto our SRO program and make them part of our family. Mm -hmm. It's just right now we don't have the funding to do that. I mean, is it practically impossible if you don't have the funds from the state to be able to provide those officers at every single campus? Not, not only is it impossible if you don't have the funds because, you know, I could just said budget is difficult but the officers aren't there because there aren't a plethora of officers sitting around going please hire me I mean I've talked to the city and to onboard the officers that we need would take them multiple years because there's a process and there's not a great pool of police officers that want to be police officers that are out there mm -hmm. um, another parent wants to know about district zoning why do some students bypass one campus, basically travel past one campus to get to another? Why not the school that's in the closest proximity? Some of that had to do with the, the growth of Pearland. Uh, when Pearland was smaller and then we had a booming growth, kind of like Alvin ISD is going now. And then as the schools were brought in, you gerrymander is not the right word, but how, we, how they cut out the zones, it was like that. Because you would build this school and then it would grow around it and you couldn't overpopulate this and so then this campus had to go this way and so there was some cross-sectioning. Through the years we have had done some rezoning, uh, but that outside of active shooter is the worst word you can say in public education. I'm going to rezone your school. I'm going to move you from here to go over there. So we still work with zoning aspects. Some part to help with that is we're an open transfer district. 
So if you are next to a school that is open, but you are zoned to a school down the road, you can ask or, or fill out the application to be transferred to that school, mm -hmm. as long as it isn't above 92% capacity. And most of our schools right now are open for transfer. Mm -hmm. So really, it sounds like some of this is about having growing pains, It right? was, yeah. and then once those lines are set, it's real hard to change them. Mm -hmm. It's real hard to manipulate those lines. I went through a rezoning because we had a, a campus that was way over uh, populated, mm -hmm. and it, uh, I worked with the community, but no matter what you throw out there, you're moving me from my school. So my child has been here two years, and now you're making them go somewhere else. It's never fun for the parent. Yeah, really difficult. So what's new for students this school year at the start of 2024? What's new? Uh, well, I hope what's new for them is they're excited to come to school. What I hope what's new for them is when they walk into the building, they feel like it's their building that it's their school, it's their culture, uh, that they are gonna come in. We, we talk about building Pearland Proud, and we talk about the how and the why. Well, the why are the kids. We have lots of to-do lists. We have lots of things we need to do, but the number one thing are students and their growth and success, and I hope that they realize that and feel that, and they have a supportive environment. They have at least one adult in the building that they can go talk to. You talked about safety. That's a big part of it. If there is something going on in your life, have that adult you can go speak with, or if you see something, have that adult you feel comfortable going to say something to, and, and that's what I hope is new for them when they come in, that they are excited to be at school, as excited as the superintendent is for the first day of school. You know, I think I said it last time I like adults but I love kids and so when they come back that's when the magic comes back in our building <laughs> what gives you hope in looking at a, a new school year and new opportunities uh, that gives me hope my community our community uh, the Pearland ISD community what we have I mean the, the people that are in ESC the people that are on the campuses the the initiatives that we are rolling out uh, like I said I just had convocation and there's a slogan that's been around in Pearland for a long time it's called the Pearland way and sometimes tradition can be motivational, but sometimes tradition can hold you back because we've always done it that way. Why don't we keep doing it that way? What I'm hopeful for and what I see in the power of the community that we have is that they see that we need to change. Our demographics are changing. Our students are changing. Our teacher needs are changing. So as a district, we need to change. And change is scary and change is difficult. But they're like, Mr. Berger, we're behind you. We know what our students need. We see who our students are. Let's make this happen. So we're rolling out ideas like instructional coaching that we haven't had before to where we have instructional coaches on the campus. We're starting at the elementary level. Let's get in the classroom to support our new teachers. Let's get in the classroom to support our students just in time. Not, not when the STAR test comes out. It's too late. That's an autopsy. Let's get in there before the negative stuff happens. We have a curriculum audit that we did, a deficit audit. We have been an A campus, an A district for a long time. So people ask, why are you looking for things that are wrong? because we can't get better unless we know what's wrong. If we think we're better than we are, we're not doing service for our kids. We ask them to get better every day. We have to get better every day. And the hope that I have is that my team is behind me because I can't do anything by myself. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just a superintendent. I sometimes call myself the mascot of the district. The work happens with my team and it happens with our community. I've heard a lot of good. And what's the biggest challenge for Pearland ISD? The, the biggest challenge for us, I, I think, is the same thing that's happening across the, across the district. Uh, I, I can talk about the state. I, I can talk about the negativity that is coming out. Um, the fear of what the new legislation session is going to be for, for what has happened. You know, are, is vouchers going to roll out? Are we going to lose funding? Are we going to get more funding? How is teacher retention going to happen? Um, some of the changes that have happened with dyslexia now moving to special programs and the evaluations that have increased and the, and the costs that have increased associated with that. And we, like we just talked, we don't have the teachers. Mm -hmm. So the needs are growing, but the funding is not and the morale is not 100%, while we had teachers come to us, they still ask, we need a little bit more. And so I always worry, what's that breaking point? What's that breaking point for us, and how do we make sure that we are supporting our teachers, we are giving our students what we need, what they need, and we're building trust with our community? And so that's my biggest thing, is, is getting our community together to make sure that we are supporting and have belief in public education and belief in Pearland ISD. So as the mascot for the district, <laughs> <laughs> do you have a message for students this year, a specific message for students this year? My specific message for students is always be who you are, show who you are, and be prepared to take care of whatever opportunity, whatever challenge comes your way. When you're in the classroom, you may not think what you're learning is important, but learn it because you never know what's coming. 
So you have a dream and you have a goal inside of you. And what we are trying to do is give you the skills you don't even know you need so you're successful and you can be successful in that. And when you are successful, come back and tell me about it. <laughs> and you'll be cheering. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> That's great.